Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's John Yulman, and my talk today is a defender's perspective on Windows memory scanning, with a particular focus on the protection fluctuation evasion approaches uh, which were introduced by Gargoyle in 2017, and how to find the footprints of such uh, hidden shellcode. Uh, there will be three tools released uh, after this talk. Um, unfortunately, no live demos today. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather and uh, I'm not going to risk it. Uh, so a quick little who am I? Uh, I'm a uh, security research engineer at Elastic. This means I get to work on their EDR product. Uh, if you want to know why EDR is in quotes, uh, then check out my opinion piece, uh, Taxonomy of Endpoint Security Bypasses, that was published today. Um, because within our EDR product, uh, I work on what I consider to be EDR, EPP, and AV features. And I think it's sometimes helpful for us to call out the specific class of feature that we're talking about. Um, I also write more technical blogs for the Elastic Security Labs, um, such as uh, Get Injected Thread, which was finding some anomalous uh, memory uh, thread start addresses. Uh, prior to Elastic, uh, I worked for the Australian Signals Directorate for about 15 years. So today I'm going to uh, run through a little bit of background, um, try and explain why it is that security products uh, scan memory at all, uh, and then just a little bit of a, a recap of uh, what the current uh, state of the art is in both memory scanning and in memory scanning evasion, uh, and then finally walk through the, the meat of this talk, which is uh, two new approaches um, to detection, um, one which uh, I think is, is a bit more novel uh, and one which is a little bit more uh, self-evident but I haven't seen it published before. Uh, and then finally, I'm gonna talk through a more, um, a way of hunting for, for, for these kinds of uh, new evasion approaches um, that hopefully will mean that these things can't, won't stay hidden for long. So why do security products scan memory? Um, so Microsoft uh, used the release of 64-bit windows to really make some critical uh, security improvements around the kernel. Um, they really hardened it uh, by bringing in things like driver signing enforcement uh, and patch guard, um, and since then it's been being enhanced with uh, virtualization-based security. Uh, the journey for Microsoft really started with Windows Vista, but it wasn't until Windows 10 that these features really achieved that market saturation. Um, so uh, it's indisputable that all of these have had a really strong positive impact on uh, Windows security. But, there's always a but. So they have, with hindsight, inadvertently made private user mode executable memory an indefensible boundary. So I like to think of this uh, in the 32-bit uh, days. Um, I was a bouncer for a nightclub. I used to put on my security jacket um, and I could walk around the club and I could kick anyone out, I could check anyone, and it was really great. Um, I, was, I was running around in the kernel, um, but unfortunately those security jackets that, that Microsoft handed out to me to say that I was uh, really all powerful, um, they would just hand them out to anyone. Um, and so Microsoft's like, no, nah, we can't have these kernel root kits, we've got to stop handing out these security jackets to anyone, um, now we're really gonna start, start doing that. So unfortunately, they now make it much harder to get that security jacket, but they've also said to the security products, hey, you can stand at the front entrance to the venue and you can check the IDs as they're coming in. Um, but you can't stand at the side door and you can't be at the bar and check the ID actually as you're serving the drinks. And you're allowed to turn and, and look behind you occasionally, but you've also got to like, you can't be permanently facing that way. So, um, to put it in more technical terms, um, for each load library call, when somebody wants to, to load a DLL or so some executable code, we get a kernel callback. That's an inline opportunity for prevention. But when some private executable memory is allocated or, or the memory is marked with virtual protect as being executable, security products do not. We do not get to check the credentials of that memory. So this security boundary for private executable memory, it cannot be reasonably retrofitted by any security product. So kernel hooks, not supported for good reasons. We wanna keep the rootkits out of the kernel. User mode hooks, really, really prevalent. Most products do it, not all, but most. Um, I would argue that given that most security products are already doing it, maybe any security, uh, sorry, any performance concerns on, on hooking are a little bit moot. Um, 
But as most of us know, use the mode hooks. Um, it's kind of like when you're in the kernel and we both were wearing the security jacket, use the mode hooks, you can't defend against code running at the same privilege as you. So use mode hooks, um, they can't defend against user mode code. They can defend against exploitation and trying to prevent that, but, um, uh, but once you've actually got that execution, um, they can't defend. Um, so we can do hypervisor shadow hooks. Um, these are technically possible, but Microsoft has effectively claimed the kernel hypervisor. So they're incompatible with, with VBS. And we don't want to have to give customers that choice between all this great stuff that Microsoft is doing um, with the hypervisor and hardening and a security product that doesn't give you all that great stuff but gives you a few different things. So um, there is arbitrary code guard. Um, and I got really excited when that feature came out. Um, and most of you probably never, never heard of it. Um, because theoretically, it's extremely, extremely powerful. You turn on arbitrary code guard for a process, you can't change any executable memory, you can't load any new private memory. Um, but because of how powerful it is, its applicability is so limited that no one uses it in practice. In fact, with the retirement of the legacy Microsoft Edge, um, I'm not aware of anyone who uses arbitrary code guard. Um, it's just too coarse-grained in, 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 what, in what it does. So what are we left with? Memory scanning. So it's not perfect, but it is still a useful defense in depth ap approach to try and find um, the, that malware that has kind of slipped through the cracks and has managed to get execution. Uh, to understand the current state of the art in memory scanning, um, I like to point out like the big three open source projects. If you understand what these three projects are doing, then you kind of got a, a good idea um, of what most of the security products are doing. Um, so on one side, you've got Yara, which is really good at writing uh, signatures on memory contents um, and finding those known bad things. Uh, at the other end, you've got Moneta, um, and it's really good at doing analysis on just the memory metadata and finding those anomalous regions of, hey, you shouldn't have these couple of flags at the same time as you've got these couple of flags, that looks bad. Uh, and then in the, in the middle, you've kind of got PEC, which kind of uh, does a bit of a hybrid approach. It's got some content heuristics, and it looks really more closely at the image metadata anomalies. Um, and if you can get past those three things, um, then you, you're probably going to get past most uh, endpoint security products. Um, so, just on evasion. So I mentioned it earlier. Gargoyle is really kind of the key, the linchpin of the current um, current uh, state of the art of, of evasion. Um, and Josh uh, Lospizino in, in 2017 published a really beautiful blog um, and did some great artwork for it. Uh, and he pointed out this, this, this really key uh, concept, which that uh, most of us, in order to reduce the computational burden of what we're doing, we can't afford to scan all the memory that there is. There's, there's so much memory, especially on 64-bit uh, address spaces. So you can't afford to scan anything. You've got to kind of really focus um, on what you're doing. And he said, most, most of these products, they're only going to scan the executable code pages. So he's like, oh, this is great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend most of my time turtled down, head in, um, or uh, turned into a stone gargoyle so you can't find me. And then I'm only going to kind of jump up and do my little thing and then, and then jump back down where you can't find me. So if you spend 99.9% .9 of the time being non-executable, it's really, really hard for that memory scanner to find you. But I think Josh was actually only half right. So scanning um, non-executable memory, absolutely, it's computationally expensive. But it's also extremely false positive prone. I'm pretty sure if I grabbed all of your laptops and scanned the memory, I would get a huge number of false positives. Like your security tools, your disassemblers, your hex editors, your browsers when they're open to blog posts with threat intelligence. Um, and even with a more broader audience of, of people who are not security professionals, you're still going to find all of these false positives in what is actually otherwise very benign memory regions. So I don't think that scanning of memory region is ever going to be an option, even with all of this great, hey, look, we can do uh, offload some of the processing to our GPU and make it really faster. I don't think you're ever going to be able to scan the whole address space because it's just you've got that false positive problem. It's just going to be too large. So we really do need to optimize um, on just those ex executable regions. So the, the crux of Gargoyle, then, is these periodic virtual protect calls, um, and specifically, that what it does is when you virtual protect memory, you remove all references 
to that region having ever been executable from the virtual address descriptor tree um, maintained by the kernel memory manager. So the VAD tree only stores two values. One, what was the original allocation protection? And two, what is the current protection? In between that, it stores no information. Uh, so a quick recap on where we are um, with all the evasion techniques. Um, so obviously there was, there was Gargoyle we mentioned earlier, um, but its way of, may, of triggering its, its way of sort of waking up um, was via an APC timer, and then it used a nice little ROP chain um, to uh, then sort of bootstrap the execution and, 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 and get itself all ready to go again. Uh, then we had Cobalt Strites, Obfuscate, and Sleep. Um, it was more just uh, encrypting the memory, so, um, uh, and then had kind of a little bit of a post-sleep stub, so you still had a thread, your thread when it got um, woken up, uh, that was your way of triggering, and then it just had a little stub of shell code that was still waiting there. Uh, and then we had foliage come along. Um, it was kind of doing both encryption and this memory state fluctuation, still using APC timers, but instead of using a ROP chain that you've got to calculate for each OS, um, it used it a, a context, a thread context, um, where you wanted to put execution back to, um, and this lovely function called NT continue, which basically says, hey, take that thread context and make it my context, kind of like set thread context for me. Um, shellcode fluctuation came along, uh, moved things up a little bit, so you still got this memory protection fluctuation, um, but instead of after the sleep, um, it would uh, trigger an exception, and then the exception handler would get you running. Uh, deep sleep came along and said, hey, well, let's still do the memory protection fluctuation, um, but we're going to do, after post-sleep, we're going to go back to using ROP chains, and then Eco came along and said, hey, we're still doing all that great fluctuation stuff, but we're going to use this new thing called a timer queue, which is different to an APC timer, and that's going to bypass some detections, and it's still using that kind of that context manipulation kind of approach. Um, and then, obviously, um, my favorite down the bottom, the oldies is still the best, um, scheduled tasks. If you're not running at all, then there's nothing to scan. Um, that's kind of outside the scope of this talk, um, but uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, the classics are the best. Um, so for a more detailed overview, I highly recommend Carl Avery's DEF CON 30 talk um, on avoiding memory scanners, uh, customizing malware to evade Yara PC even more, and the more was pretty much Manetta. Um, and uh, as he demonstrated, the evasion approaches, they work. Um, no hits on all of those things if you pull all the little techniques together. Um, so just trying to put those techniques in a slightly different format so you can see what's going on. So um, each of the approaches is effectively a variant of Gargoyle's memory protection fluctuation. They all have that, um, with the exception of Cobalt Strike. Um, but in order to avoid the fluctuation with Cobalt Strike, um, what they had to do was mark the region as read, write, execute, always. So you've always got that suspicious region, so then you've got this different class of problem. Then you're looking for execute or memory that is actually, um, doesn't look like code at all, it looks like it's an encrypted blob. So that's kind of um, slightly to the side for this talk. Um, but how do we detect all these, the, the rest of these gargoyle-style evasions? Um, so there are some niche memory scanners. Um, and each of them can detect a specific variant because of the trigger or the bootstrap. And as each one has come out, um, our offensive researchers have quickly published alternatives and said, hey, you need to work harder um, because we've got further variants ready in the back pocket for when you detect this next one. Um, so how do we detect this class of techniques more generally when we know that they've got they're gonna keep finding new triggers, they're gonna find, keep finding um, new ways of bootstrapping their code. Well, virtual protect is the choke point. It's the, it's the thing that takes you out of the VAD tree. So under the hood, virtual protect is effectively just the NT protect uh, virtual memory syscall. And for these, we have this wonderful uh, Microsoft Windows threat intelligence protect VM uh, ETW events that come from the kernel um, and they include both the protection mask and the last protection mask. So you've got this reliable way to monitor these calls that isn't reliant on user mode hooks. Now technically speaking, these events are only available to security products. Um, quick little call out to uh, Pat Hogan's Sealider TI project. It was the first project 
um, that really made these events accessible to sort of security researchers that didn't have um, uh, the blessing of an EDR company to actually be able to uh, register with Microsoft for these. Um, it used a now patched PPL exploit to do so, um, but if, like my tool, you just accidentally bring your own vulnerable driver, um, then you too can see these events. So we have the events, um, but what is anomalous? Uh, so firstly, there's always the caller. The caller is always good. So ETW events can optionally include call stacks, um, and you can inspect these for anomalies. You can look for ROP, uh, you can look for indirect calls, you look, can look for calls that are sort of originating from either uh, unsigned or untrusted code. Um, but such enrichments are currently, they're quite fragile because they're reliant on the user mode stack that is being passed by the adversary to the kernel. Um, so, and this is currently susceptible to tampering. Um, there's a few different uh, approaches out there. Um, uh, I'll leave that as um, uh, for you to, to work out yourself. Um, but as modern CPUs uh, hardware becomes more available, Microsoft will have the opportunity to harden these um, by instead of using the user supplied call stack, they will be able to use um, the, 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 the CPU's stored um, set shadow stack to generate these ETW things. And so once we've got the, the newer CPLs, uh, CPUs out there, I think it's ET, uh, sorry, Intel's 11th generation and later sort of equivalent, um, then we'll be able to use that hardware to give us the core stacks. Um, check out my colleague uh, in the front rows uh, blog on uh, Truth in the Shadows um, on how we can do these to get more accurate core stacks um, and hopefully then some of this core stack spoofing will go away. Once again, it's gonna have a long tail. We've gotta wait for the hardware. So while we have the long tail, what can we do? Um, so this is that uh, mutable code page principle that I talked about earlier. So your code pages, once they are written, they should never change. That is the, the, the life cycle of the memory protection progression for a code page should only ever be from read write to read only and executable. Um, both JIT compilers as well as AOT compilers, they only compile once. So we can simply generate an alert whenever executable memory is changed from non-executable, um, uh, from, from exec yeah, is, is, executable memory is changed to non-executable. Um, but like always, this is gonna produce some false positives that we're gonna need to deal with. Some JIT engines, unfortunately, like to uh, reuse memory allocations. Memory's not really expensive anymore and it's easy to reserve, but anyway, some older JIT engines like to reuse memory allocations. Um, so, and to be thorough, we should also try and cover those little cases where um, executable memory fluctuates from non-writable to writable. Um, but there's also going to be like a smattering of API hooking to uh, account for. Um, so somebody might hook uh, either legitimate uh, DLL code, or maybe even they're hooking um, down in the bytecode layer. They might be uh, hooking some .NET code. Um, so we're going to have to account for those. But API hooking should only happen once. Fluctuation is going executable, non-executable, executable, non-executable, executable, non-executable. Non API hooking goes, oh, non-executable, executable, non-executable, non stops. So if you rule out anything that fluctuates less than once, you get rid of most of the false positives and suddenly you've got quite a strong low, low false positive way of detecting this kind of thing. Um, and so that's uh, a little screenshot um, of the tool. Um, so it's showing both the events that we usually wouldn't alert on uh, in gray, um, and so there's stuff happening, and I, I liked that Java popped up uh, in my screenshot, it wasn't planned, but just popped up in there to let you know there is some normal stuff happening. Um, but uh, I think it was Eco in this case, it was tick-tocking back and forth, quickly showed up, there's fluctuation, way too many calls back and forth happening here. So in order to do this, we're gonna to need to have to maintain, like I said earlier, the kernel doesn't maintain that list of things that have been previously executable. We're gonna to need to maintain it ourselves. So we just need to maintain that small list internally, a bit of state to know, hey, how many times has this region changed? And as soon as it hits a threshold, and maybe if you're paranoid, you don't set it at one, maybe you set it at three, um, and then suddenly you're like, hey, this is fluctuating. But maybe the kernel does store some of this information. 
Um, so Gabe declined to come up and co-present with me. Um, but he ended up coming anyway and spoke yesterday, and he's sitting in the front row. Um, so he made an interesting discovery, and he noticed that the control flow guard bitmap entries for executable memory, once they are set, they persist beyond the lifetime of how long that memory is executable. So Gabe and I sat down, uh, we planned a week, it only took us a couple of days, um, to see what we could do with this. So a quick recap on control flow guard. Uh, so what it is, is it's time efficient lookup of valid indirect call targets. There's one bitmap per process, uh, and each two bits corresponds to 16 virtual addresses. Um, quick little geeking out here, that's not a mistake. Um, I can do maths, it's not one bit to eight virtual addresses, it's two to 16. Because um, the Microsoft engineers, they did something really, really quite amazing, and they, they, they happen to know that most compilers output code on 16-byte aligned boundaries. And the reason for this is most CPUs load cache lines in 16-byte aligned boundaries. So when you jump to a new execution point into a new function, you want as many instructions to be hot in the cache as possible. So most compilers output functions on 16-byte aligned boundaries. So what they roughly did, it's a little bit more, there's actually four states, but what they roughly did was said one bit is for that 16-byte aligned address, and the second bit is for the other 15. Um, and this basically gave them an eight times uh, stronger protection um, against accidental gadgets um, without having to make their bitmap eight times the size. Because you might have noticed the bitmap here on 64-bit is two terabytes, and that seems huge and scary until you realize it's pretty much empty and it's not taking up any physical memory at all, almost. Um, so that's because most of it is just reserved, reserved memory. This address space is reserved. You only actually have to commit when there is some executable pages. Most executable pages, they're associated with shared DLLs. Well, if the DLLs can be shared, so can the, CF, uh, the control flow guard bitmap pages. So that's all shared. That's not contributing to your, your working set. It's only when you have JIT memory, that private executable memory, that you are actually creating some additional pages in the bitmap. So PE files, they bring their own bitmap, um, but Microsoft, um, they don't want to break things, so for backwards compatibility, um, for good reasons, uh, they wanted to have a very permissive backwards compatible approach, and so the memory manager just marks everything as executable for those JIT regions. So it was designed so that uh, no code change is required, you just needed to compile with a CFG enabled compiler. So, uh, in the second tool, we then utilize that observation from Gabe, that the CFG bitmap is not updated when non-image memory is toggled, um, and we can then find any addresses that have been executable during the lifetime of a process. We just need to find the, the, um, the CFG bitmap. Um, it's not documented where it lives, but it's quite easy. Once you've got execution to know where it is, once again, it's an exploit protection. It's not protecting against code that's already running. Um, and then we can search the CFG pages um, to find any pages that have all the bits set. And like I said, it's very sparse, it's very quick. In fact, if you want to try and find all of the executable memory in a process, don't walk the bad tree. If you walk the CFG bitmap in a CFG-enabled process, you can make a lot less syscalls just to work out where all of the executable regions are. Um, unfortunately, uh, so anyway, so this worked beautifully. Protection fluctuation stands out, boom, 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 red lights. Um, there's a, an example of uh, shellcode fluctuation. The region stands out. Um, the unfortunate bit is false positives, as always. So the CFG bitmap is also not updated when memory is freed. Um, some JIT compilers, um, so .NET, you've got an assembly loaded. Um, eventually, it'll be like, ah, oh, no, unloaded, release that memory. So the memory is back into the general pool. Um, and then if somebody else accidentally allocates that memory, then you're going to get these, these false positives. You can kind of mostly work out where they are because the allocations don't match up with the regions and a few other bits and pieces. Um, but it does mean that if you're in the right process, like a .NET one, um, you can probably craft a memory region, if you're very tricky, um, that looks similar to this. Um, there is a stricter opt-in version um, that I wrote after writing some pithy comments about Microsoft should have made a stricter opt-in version. I'm like, oh, they did. Um, uh, where you can allocate memory with something called page targets invalid. And in that case, your JIT compiler allocates all zeros. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the kernel memory manager puts all zeros in the control flow guard bitmap, and then you can toggle the ones that you need to toggle afterwards. Um, nobody except Chakra does that, and Chakra is pretty rare now. 
Um, so <laughs> um, I could modify my code to try and account for that and find anything and then just deal with sort of higher false positives, but it's much easier just to modify for anyone using that flag, and if you're not Chakra, then just saying, hey, um, that's, that's, that's pretty weird. Um, so are there still evasion opportunities? Absolutely. Um, as I said earlier, this is a defense in depth measure. It's never going to actually be a security boundary. Um, uh, so, though personally, I think that the current set of evasion things, they're actually really quite noisy. Um, the fluctuations is so many calls for virtual protect going back and forth, and then you've got all these footprints that are starting to appear in the control flow guard uh, bitmap if you're in the right process. Um, potentially, you could jump to a new allocation every time, and so then you kind of look like just new JIT code every time, but then you're really starting to build up a bit of heavy weight in that control flow guard bitmap, so we could probably set some thresholds there as well. Um, uh, there might be a few occasional rare processes where the kind of behaviors that I'm describing are very common, um, but once again, most people, those, those processes aren't gonna be on every system, um, and certainly not in the core Windows processes where people like to hide. Um, you're not going to find these um, kind of behaviors in service host. You might find it in some .NET somewhere, maybe. Uh, to me, I would just go with a less is more approach. Um, so I would still encrypt all my data pages because um, uh, malware analysts, they love to write signatures on strings and on data because code compilers can output different code day to day. Um, whereas, well, compiler updates, they should be deterministic. Um, whereas the strings, that really requires the, the author of the code to change it. Um, so it's much stronger to write on the strings. So if you encrypt your strings and just leave your, your, your code pages unencrypted, then you're not gonna jump out to any of these techniques. Um, and for your code, um, just obfuscate it once against all the current signatures that you're aware of. This is effectively what we do already for sort of the, the AV scanning and the files on disk. The only difference is for the files on disk, most people use in-memory packet type approaches, which is what we've said doesn't work. Um, so you're gonna have to use more sort of binary rewriting approaches. Um, so just that little, little bit of a, a step up in the complexity, but still you should be able to tweak your code to bypass the current set of signatures at a point in time. So finally, um, we've talked about two detecting, uh, detection approaches. This last one is more of a hunting approach. Um, it's an approach to telemetry collection that without prior knowledge, you should still have flagged that the evasion as a new behavior having occurred and requiring investigation. This is because when you're in a process, even if you hide your shell code perfectly, you gotta do something. You're there for a purpose. And, and when you're running, at some point, you're gonna make some syscalls. So the only way to truly hide is to only ever make syscalls that are the same as what the host process was doing. But if you're only doing the same as what the host process, well, you're not really malware, you're just legitimate, probably a remote access tool that's being used illegitimately, but we won't talk about how people love to use those at the moment. Um, so how are we gonna find this, this abnormal at scale when a process suddenly starts doing something that's not meant to be doing? So most of the academic papers they love to do dynamic malware detonation using full syscall traces in this heavily instrumented sandbox environment. You get thousands and thousands and thousands of events. Think Procmon, but even more. Um, way too verbose for production use um, across your entire fleet. So then you've got the other end of the scale, which is what most EDR solutions currently focus on, um, and is absolutely what, what the first thing you should do, which is to find the highly suspicious syscalls and only generate telemetry for those. Um, but I think there's something in the middle, um, some way that we can take that large amount of telemetry and still provide just enough for people to know what's going on. Instead of sending thousands of events or hundreds of interesting events, can we just send tens of behaviors? Um, so you're probably all familiar with like the import table um, of, uh, of a P file, of a binary. And it basically gives you a good overview of what's going on um, about that process. Just, just what, what APIs is it calling? Well, at runtime, we can construct something very similar. We can look at all the syscalls they're making and say, hey, here's a table of all the syscalls that they've made. But we can keep a little bit more than just the name of the function. So we can discard any high cardinality events um, so for virtual protect earlier, rather than saying, hey, this is the specific address that they did at this particular time, we can just keep um, uh, whether it was uh, mem image or mem private, uh, 
And for size, well, size changes so much, just throw that out entirely. Throw away all of those bits um, and, and just keep. Um, this is a little bit similar to what Kappa was doing with static analysis, where they were finding specific call sites with specific set of parameters to say, hey, um, this is what's happening. Um, but Kappa and Import Table and Impash, they're all uh, weak against um, uh, get proc address. Because get proc address, you can just say, hey, I'm dynamically going to resolve this. Um, and I am unfortunately out of time. Um, so I might uh, wrap it up. Um, the tool is out there. Have a look. Um, uh, I don't write GUIs, but somehow I did. Um, I will just quickly uh, talk about what we did today. Um, memory scanning, useful layer of defense. Um, cat and mouse game of cybersecurity, offensive security researchers, they've helped us find the gaps and we've improved it. I think there's a few good ways that I've talked about how we can either detect it or one, try and detect these anomalies at scale, but detection is not equal to prevention. So the Microsoft's current architecture doesn't provide us with what we need to su sufficient opportunities to, to stop these in-memory threats. And I think we're at the, there's enough in the wild, in-memory threats happening that we need something better um, that it meets that threshold for, uh, for servicing now. Um, in the meantime, security vendors, we're going to do our best um, such that while these threats might be able to run, they're not going to be able to hide for too long. Um, any questions? Uh, that's where the three tools will be released on, uh, on my GitHub uh, eventually, um, and various references for all of the tools um, and evasions and bits of the OS that I talked about today. Slides will come up on the Black Hat site tomorrow. Um, grab me in the hallway. We're out of time for questions. Thank you.